I'm ready, yeah. So what do you want me to do to like um, lead you in? No, no, no. I think I'll just start. Uh, okay, no problem. Kind of cold open stuff. Okay, well, that makes sense. It is about ice cream. Carl, favorite ice cream flavor, go. Uh, uh, what's the Ben and Jerry's one? That's awesome. The fish food. That one. Fish that, food. that one kicks ass. Wrong. It's Rocky Road. Oh, we don't have that over here. The whole reason it's called Rocky Road is because it's supposed to help you through the uh, Great Depression and the stock market crash. They brought it out like right after the the, the markets crashed in the in the twenties, and it was like, this will help. People's lives are ruined. Like nobody has any money, and we are entering what is going to be known as the Great Depression. Let's eat ice cream. That's. That's kind of amazing because like the, the hacky trope for when someone's depressed is them just sitting there crying, eating ice cream. And that was <laughs> right. just for an entire country. That's amazing. Right? Yeah, and it, it sort of just shows America's weird, weird ass fascination with ice cream, especially mm -hmm. compared to other countries. Um, the, the main thing that I was going to talk about is uh, basically uh, in World War II, you know, the whole world is at war. Everything yes. needs to be rationed. America is the only country on either side that refused to ration sugar because <laughs> we could that, that not make ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> so everybody else did. I think Britain said, hey, carrots are like just as good. Oh, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's a thing. This is a right. real thing during World War II, during rationing, kids would be given a carrot on a stick as a treat. <laughs> Can you imagine a right. sadder, just sigh, then a child who's like had a really rough day. And it's like, look, don't worry, we've got a treat for you here. And it's just a carrot on a stick. Right, and by a really rough day, it's it's like a bombing raid or something. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the worst time ever. And so you kind of make sense. Americans are all about freedom and ice cream, I suppose. So we were the only, maybe the only country at all that didn't ration sugar specifically because of ice cream. And okay. my favorite story uh, about how this played out. So it. It went to the troops, right? So the troops had to have ice cream as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this battle going on in the Coral Sea. Maybe it was the Battle of the Coral Sea. And the USS Lexington, which is an aircraft carrier maybe, um, gets hit and it's sinking. Yeah, it's a boat, it's a big boat. Very um, large boat, yes. Yeah, uh, it starts to sink and the sailors are told that they need to jump overboard because you know, there's going to be no boat in a minute. And they say, that's a good idea. But first, they all ran down to the cafeteria or the no. the mess hall or whatever. And they filled their helmets with ice cream and then jumped off. <laughs> so, I guess. So, well, we sat here waiting for rescue as we're being strafed by machine gun fire from passing right. airplanes. What else are you going to do but just like shove like your gob full of ice cream, I suppose? But it feels like you'd really want to wear that helmet if there's there's active Japanese fighter planes shooting at you in the water. You'd want some protection. But I guess ice cream made them feel better about it. Like maybe we're gonna die, but hey, we got Rocky Road. You didn't die in ice cream. <laughs> yeah, just like shoving a helmet full of ice cream. And like um, you spoke about rationing, and I think over in the UK we did ration almost everything. But there's a couple of things right. that weren't rationed. One of them was fish and chips for a similar reason. So I'm guessing sugar. <laughs> not being yeah. rationed over in the United States. It's fish and chips were not rationed because they were seen as being so integral to British identity and morale. That's funny. That it That's was so really important for people to be able to have fish and chips and have that some, like some semblance of normalcy. And I think it's the right. same with alcohol as well, where alcohol was, rash, was never rationed, but they just raised the price so people could still go to the pub after a long, hard day at the factory <laughs> or getting like yeah. go through a bombing raid. Right. That's so interesting. So that's funny because when I was reading about this, I just thought, oh, Americans are, you know, dumb and they needed ice cream when everybody else was was rationing. But it's just maybe every country needed whatever their specific identifier. So Americans yeah. got ice cream. The British got fish and chips. Maybe Germany and had Wiener schnitzel. Yeah. That, um, and beer. I think Germany, was it methamphetamine? They used to give all their soldiers. <laughs> so they didn't yeah. ration the meth. But over in the UK, there was like a couple of other things that were rationed but they were seen as being again so integral to like british morale that they yeah. would like find a way to get them to people um, one of which was oranges and oranges yeah. were only allowed to be handed out by doctors and they were given to pregnant women because vitamin c was so hard to get um, uh, yeah. during the war and the other one was bananas 
um, which were seen as like the ultimate treat, and they could only be gotten from the tropics, and they could only be transported in, okay. I believe, like refrigerated boats, which were all commandeered for the war effort. So immediately after World War II, they got several refrigerator ships to bring like thousands of bananas to the United <laughs> Kingdom, and then gave like one banana to every child. <laughs> That's so great, because you know how much, how freaking pissed Americans would be if that was our treat at the end of a war. It's like, hey, banana. bananas. It'd be like, what the hell? I'm here for the ice cream. It's all, for some reason, that reminds me, too, of um, just the way that our, our relationship to food changes. Mm -hmm. um, they used to give prisoners, in America anyway, uh, lobster because they thought it was gross and it was cheap and nobody likes lobster. And then at some point... I don't know, the prisoners liked it too much or something, and somebody was like, hey, lobster's great. We should we should yeah. charge $30 a lobster or whatever, and, and now prisoners don't get lobster anymore. Um, I, I wonder how long they were holding on to that secret. They're like, this is great. Don't yeah, tell anyone. This is anyone. delicious. Never yeah. tell anyone the deliciousness <laughs> of the lobster. Cause I think the, the facts I've heard about lobsters is that they were so plentiful, they used to wash up on the shore in piles okay. of like five foot high. That's yeah. why they were seen. It's like, well, surely something this plentiful can't be good. <laughs> right. And we should give it to our a, prisoners, yeah. <laughs> when you just look at a field that's like a million cows deep and go, come on, do you not right. get this? <laughs> In the UK and like British forces, like tea is seen as being mm. just as integral. And yep. um, going back beyond World War II, there were battles that were won by the opposing forces against the British because they attacked the British during tea time. <laughs> I think That's... it was during like maybe the War of Independence. There was one battle where the British were having tea time, and they just did not expect anyone to attack after like 4 p.m. So why would you attack at dusk? That's stupid. You can't see anything. <laughs> A fact about the British Army that I adore, because it just sums up Britain, is that every British Challenger tank has to have a kettle installed in it. <laughs> <laughs> like they have to have like onboard tea making facilities for the soldiers inside. Wow. That is amazing. Actually, <laughs> that that's great too because uh, it's it wasn't built in in the same way. But the American bomber crews, what mm -hmm. they would do is they would take uh, ice cream mix, and they okay. would they would just hang it from the bomber. Then they would go on a mission you know, blow up a factory or whatever, and then come back, and then the cold air and the vibrations from the, from <laughs> firing guns at, uh, like, the enemy or whatever, would churn the ice cream mix and turn it into ice cream. So they would have a little treat <laughs> when they got home from murdering people or whatever. <laughs> There's that half of simile with British soil, I think World War One, uh, To stop guns overheating, they would generally put bags of water over the barrel. And soldiers, oh, yeah. uh, enterprising soldiers at least, um, soon learn if you put a tea bag in that bag of water, shot <laughs> the gun for a few minutes, and then poured the water out, you had perfectly um, uh, piping hot tea. And they had to eventually be like, stop doing this, you're wasting ammo to make tea. Right. <laughs> it's funny, I, I love the idea when people are just, weapons are so plentiful that they're using that to do something as basic as cooking tea in a good way. Like, like, yeah. we're basically approaching that scene in The Simpsons where Homer uses a gun to open a beer. Right. <laughs> like, we're at that level, yeah. essentially, with this. It's like, like during Vietnam, soldiers would burn C4 to set fires. Like, they'd get asked, why are you doing this? Because it, it burns better than anything we've got. They would burn it like they would just blow yeah. it up or they would just no, set no, it on No, use fire? it as tinder because it's um, so um, <laughs> stable that you can set it on fire and it burns for a couple hours. It's basically a candle. So they'd use... Uh, <laughs> Just C4 to light fires. And another one I remember reading about was an account of the Vietnam War, and it's um, grenade pins. Do you know the whole thing about pulling a grenade out with your, the grenade pin out with your teeth? Um, uh, I, no, I don't that's, think so. That's basically impossible. Uh, because the, the cotter pin, I think it's called, is like got several pounds of force behind it. Okay. And um, it's common practice for soldiers to fold over the pin to stop it coming out accidentally. And I remember reading an account from a guy in Vietnam who walked into a tent and saw someone using his grenade as a coat hook. As in, like, you put a grenade and then hung stuff from the grenade's pin because it has, like, you need, like, so many pounds of stuff to pull out the pins. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll use it as a coat hook. It's like, some people just don't care, do they? <laughs> That's so wild to me. I guess it's, when you're in a war zone and people are actively shooting at you, you know, what's, what's messing with a grenade or setting C4 on fire or making like, tea yeah. out of a tank or whatever? 
But it's like, uh, that's where bomber jackets came from, isn't it? Like the idea of like the customised bomber jacket that um, Air Force pilots and stuff would wear. Yeah. Where they would get criticised by the commanding officer for customising their jackets. Like, that's a military issue, you can't do it. It's like, well, we've got a lifespan less than a fucking mayfly when we're in the air. What yeah. do you care if we do this? And that's where that idea came from. Because like, we're going to die anyway, we might as well go out, like, we might as well die looking stylish. Yeah, that's actually, so even on that exact same thing, the whole reason that we hang, well, we don't anymore, but people used to hang fuzzy dice in their mirrors, like of their, <laughs> of their like greaser cars, is because pilots were dying so much, they would hang real dice from their planes as okay. sort of a good luck charm. And then it got back to America and they were like, well, what if we just start hanging them in our cars? Like they were, their their dangerous thing was like hot rod racing or whatever, yeah. and they would hang dice. And then of course, we get further and further from what it's supposed to be, and the dice just get less. They're not actually dice anymore. They get bigger and pinker and fuzzier. And so yeah. by the time you're at the seventies or eighties, it's just some asshole with dice in the mirror. But it's supposed to, it came from fighter pilots in World War II thinking that they were going to die at any minute and looking for any way to sort of give them good luck or something like that. Oh man, it's a shame we never got to the idea of someone just hanging like a rabbit's foot from um, like their window. Because then you could, if you like, you know, did the same thing with the dice, so they get larger and fuzzier. That could result in someone putting like an entire stuffed rabbit just around their, their mirror right. for yeah. good luck. But that reminds me again, like, you know, People doing World War II, they brought back like a, a you know a new fashion. That's where t-shirts fucking came from. Like t-shirts were seen as like undergarments exclusively. Um, but I think it was um, uh, sailors on ships when they were working down in the engines would take off um, like their sailor dress uniforms, wear their undershirts, and then realize yeah. these things are kind of comfy because so they'd wear them when they were on leave and things right. like that. So and then, like foreigners saw them and thought, oh wow, this must be American fashion. It's, like, it's not American fashion. It's just you know it's members right. of the military just like, you know, dressing down. But they yeah. thought, oh wow, American fashion. So t-shirts became fashionable. <laughs> it's just a bunch of that. dudes walking around in their underwear and they're like, yeah, that must yeah. be what Americans do. That's funny because that's actually, I think Britain also had a similar thing in World War, I think one, where uh, because they were having so many, it might've been two, but there were so many bombing raids um, that people were always running out into the street in the middle of the night. Yes. Um, whenever the alarms would go off. And so eventually they were like, I want to look better when I, I do this. Yet. And so they that's where pajamas came from. Like nice looking pajamas is because uh, people were tired of running into the street in these you know, ridiculous, like modern pajamas, these massive nightgowns, or they were sleeping yeah. in their underwear or whatever. So they were, they were putting on fashionable pajamas so that while the buildings exploded around them, they still looked hot to their neighbors or whatever. Yeah, and uh, I love, like that was during the Blitz, because the Blitz was just one of these weird times in British history where people just stopped giving a fuck. And <laughs> there are stories, and I think this is where like British stoicism and like the, the idea of the British stiff upper lip um, yeah. was like just crystallized because there are stories of office workers walking through just a destroyed town, finding their office that was now just like, you know, a pile of rubble, dragging their desk out of the rubble and then starting work. That's wild. Yeah, and there's like that famous image you've probably seen around like a Milkman on his rounds. Yeah. The day after a bombing raid, which I think was staged, but it was only staged because an actual Milkman could not be found because he'd already finished his rounds. <laughs> he was already done working. Right, that's awesome. I don't oh, think you could have made Americans do that unless, you know, they found Rocky Road in the in the ashes. Just just fill everything with Rocky Road. Like, <laughs> I want, like, those bulletproof um, uh, fridges that Indiana Jones hides in, just full of Rocky Road everywhere. One final ice cream to World War II connection to America, whatever, that I think is funny is, you know, ice cream was constantly being used as propaganda. Not propaganda, but kind of like a morale booster and whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's this just this freaking wild uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon where Bugs Bunny, I think he, he, he like storms Iwo Jima or like one of these Pacific islands no. and encounters a bunch of Japanese soldiers who are portrayed very negatively. And he calls them things you shouldn't be calling people. Um, but I think he placates them by giving them ice cream. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to, you were going to mention the one where he uh, accidentally tunnels his way to like Nazi Germany. Because okay. that's where the famous Bugs Bunny line, I must have made a wrong turn at Albuquerque. It was first <laughs> uttered in like a World War II propaganda short. Mm. See, you know, 
I knew I should have made a left turn at Albuquerque. Black Forest, huh? <laughs> Where he kicks the shit out of uh, like several members of the Nazi high command and then impersonates Hitler. And it's like, oh, Good you free. forget that just <laughs> these things have been around so long. Like Bugs Bunny, for example. Like before he was playing like basketball with Michael Jordan, LeBron James, <laughs> he was going to Nazi Germany to help end the war effort. It's amazing how many, uh, so obviously there's a lot of technological innovation that comes from war, but there's so much ridiculous cultural innovation that comes from it as well. War is bad, but sometimes some really interesting things come out of it. <laughs> they do, yeah. It's, like, it's where we get tampons from and super glue. Yeah. A topic so for another to day, war. maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's, war is justified so that we can get tampons and, and ice cream. Because that's the things that I know right now, someone's going, there's no way that war resulted in the invention of tampons and superglue, and they have to wait for the next episode. That <laughs> right. is how you get people to come back. <laughs> that's why we're professionals.